Fish in a Tree by Linda Mullally Hunt. Chapter 16, What I've Got. Page 88. I like Mr. Daniels, but he's got a thing for reading. Always talking about books and how great they are. Personally, I'd rather have the flu. The last thing Mr. Daniels said yesterday was that we were going to write stories today and that it would be our chance to show him what we've got. The only thing I've got is a plan. With a big piece of cloth and a safety pin, my writing arm hangs in a sling. How can he ask me to write like this? I'm feeling pretty proud, I must admit. All I have to do is remember not to move it. I wish it really did hurt. It would be easier. He sees me when I walk in, and it isn't long before he comes over to ask me what has happened. I have practiced the story all the way to school, about how I tripped over my cat on the stairs and fell. You have a cat? He asks. Yeah. He nods, then he glances down at my sling. Is it a new cat? No, we've had that cat forever. A regular member of the family. I say, feeling like I'm starring in a commercial for something I'd never eaten in a million years. He has a weird look on his face when he asks, What's its name? Whose name? Your cat. I panic. Porkchop pops out of my mouth. He laughs. Porkchop the cat, huh? I bet the dogs in the neighborhood like that. I'm nervous and embarrassed, wondering why I have to be so weird. Wondering why I now have to watch the mind movie in my head of a furry meowing porkchop with a tail. But when the rest of the class sits down to do their writing assignments, he says I can read a book. I stare at the letters and watch them dance and move on the bright white page. My eyes ache and my head hurts. Mr. Daniels watches me, so I look down at the page and remember to turn it every once in a while. With my eyes closed, I watch bright movies of me flying, one of my favorite movies. In this one, I'm flying just above the water, my stomach almost touching it, racing toward a castle filled with blue light. I open my eyes a bit to watch the others write. I look at the page again. I even try to read some. I really do. But I can't help wondering why Mr. Daniels keeps looking over at me. Chapter 17, Misfit Lunch, page 91. I watch Albert sit at his desk and stare at the pages of a book. I know he's not reading. His eyes don't move at all. I see he has a new bruise on his jaw and decide I'll go over and talk to him. Hey, I say. He looks up. Then something comes out of my mouth that I don't expect. Do you want to sit with Keisha and me at lunch? Why? Well, you sit alone and we sit alone, but together too, so I thought that we could all sit alone together. That isn't a logical conclusion. Clearly, if we are all together... Yeah, I interrupt. I know, it was a joke. So you want to? Well, I suppose so. I guess I've got to eat somewhere, he says. Albert leans his chair back as he shakes his empty carton of chocolate milk to let the drops fall on his tongue. I wonder who decided that a half pint of milk was enough. Why don't you just buy two? He puts his chair down and stares. Can't you just ask your mom for extra money in the morning? I say, readjusting my fake flakes. Excuse me. I say, readjusting my fake sling. This thing is a pain. I don't have to ask for money. It's kind of prepaid. And then I realize all at once, of course, how stupid can I possibly be? Albert doesn't have many clothes, and he gets a ticket from Mr. Daniels every morning. I guess I never thought about it before. He must get one of the free lunches. I hope I didn't upset him, so I say, I'm sorry. About what? Well, about, well, you know, that you get the free lunch. He shrugs. There are worse things than a free lunch, I mean. Yeah, I guess. Page 93. It disturbs my mom, but my dad says he wants to leave his mark on mankind with one of his inventions, and she says he should get a real job. They fight about it a lot, actually. I'm really surprised he told me that, and I decided to never tell another soul about it. Hey, says Keisha, sitting down. Hey, I say, and Albert nods. So, Albert, Keisha says, I watch Star Trek because you are always spouting off about it. The special effects are not that special. Kind of pathetic, actually, like a first-grade puppet show. Albert looks horrified. Keisha laughs as she unwraps her sandwich. Yeah, I knew that would getcha. Shay's voice arrives, arrives before she does. Look, Jessica, she says as they walk by. It's the Island of Misfit Toys. Yeah, Jessica says. It's like a six-legged freak. Shay laughs, and Jessica looks proud of herself. Uh, those girls are like walking pricker bushes, Keisha says, taking a bite of her sandwich. Don't let them bother you. They don't bother me, Albert says. Doesn't bother you at all that she called us misfit toys? I ask. Page 94. It doesn't bother me, Keisha says. That girl can flap her gums about me until the sun rises and sets again. I really don't care. I wish I didn't care, and I wish I wasn't jealous of Shay and all that she was. Albert is wide-eyed. But why are the toys all misfits? 
Square wheels on a train can be fixed easily enough. Albert has his most serious voice turned up to high. And what's wrong with the doll anyway? Why is it a misfit? It seems to adhere to the standards of a typical doll. Wow, he is in full professor mode. The Charlie in the box, he continues, is just like a Jack in the box in every way but his name. Something is not a misfit simply because it has a different name. That isn't true, I blurt out. He looks shocked. I suppose he isn't used to being corrected. He holds up his milk carton. Suppose I say this is orange juice. It doesn't change what it is inside. That's different, I say, thinking that the milk will feel like it's orange juice if it's told that enough. It is the same principle. I think of words like dumb and baby and think how wrong Albert really is. What about the cowboy? Keisha asks. He rides an ostrich instead of a horse. That has got to make him a misfit. It is illogical to say he is a misfit just because he chooses to ride a different animal, provided he can carry out his cowboy duties. Albert, Keisha says, how can you possibly say cowboy duties with a straight face? I don't understand, he says. Keisha's forehead touches the table and he continues, especially when you consider that ostriches run faster than horses, require less water to drink, and can use their legs and feet as weapons. They are fierce kickers with sharp claws. I, for one, would trade a horse for that. That's just logical. And then I think that if someone hung a sign on me that said anything, having that sign there wouldn't make it so. The people have been calling me slow forever, right in front of me, as if I'm too dumb to know what they're really talking about. People act like the words slow reader tell them everything that's inside, like I'm a can of soup and they can just read the list of ingredients and know everything about me. There's lots of stuff about the soup inside that they can't put on the label, like how it smells and tastes and makes you feel warm when you eat it. There's got to be more to me than just a kid who can't read well. Chapter 18, page 96. Truths and Untruths. Keisha drops into her seat, annoyed that Mr. Daniels has asked her to do a paper over because he knows she can do better. I've always hated hearing that from teachers. And then I realize I've never heard it from Mr. Daniels. And all of a sudden that bugs me. Since the day of the mystery boxes, I keep thinking about how good it felt to do something right, to fit in. That's what I want, to feel like everyone else, to be told that the work I know is terrible isn't good enough. I want him to tell me I can do better and see it in his face that he really thinks so. And then I remember that it is the best I can do. I haven't written in class since I had the fake sling on my arm. After three days of wearing it, Mr. Daniels told me he was going to have the nurse call my mom about my injured arm, so I I figured I'd better lose the sling. So now I'm stuck. I don't know who to be, the one who admits that I can't do it or the pretender. Finally, I decide I'll give Mr. Daniels something so, so terrible that he'll have to ask me to do it over. I don't even try to spell anything correctly like I usually do. I just put a whole bunch of letters together that even I know make no sense. I walk up and hand it to him instead of putting it in the assignment cubby. Thanks, Allie, but if you're done, why don't you put it in the cubby? I push it toward him a little more. I thought you may want to check it over. We lock eyes for a few seconds, and he reaches over to take it from me. Okay, he says. He looks at it. His eyebrows scrunch up, and then he looks back at me. He stays quiet, thinking, I can tell. I hear it in my head. Do better, Allie. And I would. I would magically do better, and Mrs. Silverk would carry a trophy for me so big, she'd have to carry it on her back. Allie? Huh. I said that you can just put it in the cubby, then. Page 98. And the pictures in my head pop like bubbles. I walk away without taking it back. As soon as we all sit down in the cafeteria... Keisha announces to Albert, Okay, this has been killing me all day long. What? I ask. Albert, so this flint shirt that you wear every day. He interrupts. I do not, in fact, wear the same shirt every day. I have five identical ones. Keisha's eyes are wide. Seriously, Albert? You bought the same shirt five times? He doesn't seem to think it's a big deal. It's the one I liked. Well, anyway, Albert, Keisha says, I finally found out what the heck your shirt means. I googled Flint, and you know what I found? His eyes widen. It's a place in Michigan, a kind of rock, something people use to light campfires, what arrowheads are made of, and a kind of sneaker. Albert doesn't say anything. Albert, did you hear me? What is with the Flint shirt? That just makes no sense. No sense whatsoever. Albert fidgets. Page 99. Hey, Albert, I say, you okay? You know, Keisha didn't mean any harm. She just, I am quite aware of her intentions. I worry. What are those? To find out why I wear this shirt. Funny how my brain wants to make things complicated, and his just cuts to the simplest thing. Well, the simplest thing with a bunch of fancy words and mile-long sentences. The meaning of my shirt is not any of those things. 
He closes his eyes before he takes a deep breath. Flint is an immortal genius from Star Trek, Season 3, Episode 19. It is titled Requiem for... Keisha laughs, interrupting him. Albert, are you kidding me? Albert clears his throat and glances at the clock. Albert, I say, poking the side of Keisha's leg, and she, by some miracle, stops laughing. Go ahead, I want to know. After that day of being mean, I want to be extra nice. So Flint is a smart guy? I ask. Albert readjusts himself in his seat. Flint goes away to his own planet. He puts up invisible barriers so that others won't sense life forms there. He creates robots to protect himself and keep him company. They are predictable. Sounds super weird if you ask me, says Keisha. Why wouldn't he live on Earth with people? He had once lived on Earth. He left to be alone. He wanted to be alone. Keisha falls forward, dropping her arms on the table. Why the heck would a man leave Earth with everything here to go off and sit in some rock in space all by himself? Albert hesitates. Well, he says it's to retreat from the unpleasantness of Earth and the company of people. Then he looks up right into my eyes. I can see that. I can see why someone would want to avoid being with other people. A great number of them are not very nice to me. And, well, oh, listen, Albert, Keisha's voice has softened. Softened. I didn't mean... Albert interrupts. I was not implying it was you who was not kind to me. I'm relieved. But there are others who are not kind he says.